This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and today our special guest is Darren Bloomquist. Darren is Vice President of Market Economics at Auction.com. In this role, Darren analyzes and forecasts complex macro and microeconomic data trends within the marketplace and industry to provide value to both buyers and sellers using the Auction.com platform. He previously served as Vice President at Adam Data Solutions, where he was widely recognized as an authority in the housing and mortgage industries. Darren's reports and analysis have been cited by thousands of media outlets, including all the major news networks and leading publications, such as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and USA Today. Darren has been quoted in hundreds of publications and appeared in many national network broadcasts, including CBS, ABC, CNN, CNBC, Fox Business, and Bloomberg. So, Darren, we welcome you to our show. Yes, great to be here. Thanks for having me. This is not a planned question, but I was just curious because I'm going to compliment the company that you're at. Have you ever attended a live auction? I absolutely have, yeah. It's not easy to pull one off. To have auction.com, you know, they, they weren't around in the 70s and 80s and, and 90s. When they stepped in and dominated so quickly, I was really shocked because it's not easy to pull off a live auction. And that was really prior to, you know, all the online changes and everything. So... It was a pretty yeah. ma major transition because, you know, I used to attend all those auctions. And as a matter of fact, we actually had thought I could see foreclosures were going to explode. And I thought, okay, I think we could start an auction company. So we held an auction with 15 houses. I would say my staff and I worked harder in a 30 day period than we've ever worked in our life. And we kind of, you know, we felt like we knew what we were doing. We sold one of those houses out of about 15 and I, I was never more proud of the effort. I remember sitting there with uh, my sons, Aaron and Greg, and who also worked their butt off. They were sad. I said, don't be sad. We worked so hard. We were, uh, were able to say we do not know this business well enough to do it. It saved us, yeah, it saved us I, a lot of time. I observed, yeah, I observed the same thing when I was over at Adam. You know, we were involved in the tracking data in the foreclosure market. We weren't involved in the actual transaction, but I did at that point, prior to auction.com really getting involved in the space much, um, at least in the foreclosure auction space, I attended an auction, I think, in, at the Orange County Courthouse or at, uh, at the LA County Courthouse, one of the two uh, over in Norwalk. It was hard to even find the, the auction because it was just kind of a circle of, <laughs> of, of, of guys standing around and one guy with a computer. And then a few years later, once auction.com was in, running many of the auctions across the country, I went back and observed and it was a completely different environment. They had, you know, they set up the auction in a hotel ballroom. I'm sure you've seen this, you know, they oh, had yeah. the big screens up with the photos of the homes, which is crazy. You can actually at least see the outside of the home yeah. and as much information as possible about those properties and, you know, professional auctioneer up there. And yeah, that, so that impressed me from afar that they had really, revolutionized change the the way those were done and that was part of the appeal coming over here yeah now you're talking specifically about the end process of the foreclosure process you know literally the trustee sale yeah that was a insider's game like you say if you went to any particular county on any particular location six to ten people that was about it right and now it's uh so it made it much more competitive um, and that's, if you're, if you're selling something that would, that would be nice. The other thing that happens if you're an auction company that has good success for both the buyer and the seller, there's an accumulation of customer base. That's astonishing. So when auction.com has a property up for sale in a city, what are the odds? They don't have any buying customers in that city. None. It's zero. They have tons of people that are already looking for the next thing. And so that's a big, that's a big deal. It really is. Yeah. I mean, certainly the sellers, you know, we're selling these homes on behalf of the banks and the sellers. And so the banks in the past considered the trustee sale as it was just something they had to do. It was a checkbox. 
let's get through the trustee sale so we can take back the property and then sell it. We brought the idea that it can be a good place to sell the property if you do some marketing and, and attract a broader pool of buyers to that environment. It can be a great place to sell and actually benefit you. You don't have to take on the risk of holding that property. Let a local real estate investor <laughs> take on that risk. And, uh, and so that's, that did change the perspective of the sellers on that trustee sale that it actually can be a marketplace. Um, and yeah, certainly we have, you know, millions of buyers across the country, potential buyers, and we're, you know, we're doing even more introducing more technology to level, even more level the playing field at the trustee sale, which I understand that may not always be good news for the folks who are attending that because it does mean more competition. But um, generally speaking, we think more transparency in a marketplace is better. And we're introducing something called remote bid, where you actually don't have to attend the auction in person, which is one of the big hurdles. You can do it from your phone. There's still the cash, all cash hurdle to overcome, but that's something we're working on. Of course, the challenge we have now, and we can talk about this too, maybe as a good segue, is the, uh, there's not very many foreclosure auctions happening right now because of the, the moratorium. And it's a good point to, to think about normally auction companies, and this was also interesting about auction.com, they always found the niche. So they uh, long ago, they did the, the land tax sale auctions. And then when they're really bad times, like 2008 and nine and so forth, you're going to end up with either tons of trustee sales or you're going to end up with tons of REO auctions. By the end of 2019, you could count all the foreclosures on, you know, two hands, basically. There wasn't a lot. Mm -hmm. So to survive during really good times, you know, you really have to think about your business model. But what's really interesting, you know, like you, I pay, I pay attention to charts. We're in uncharted territory. I'm yeah. <laughs> looking at what's next is, okay, usually you go backwards and say, okay, well, what happened before in similar setup, well, there there really isn't a similar chart or time frame to look at. So it's it's just going to be really interesting about what's next. So yeah, I'd love I'd love your take about do you think there will be a big impact on foreclosures that occur, first of all? Well, the word I guess the operative word there is big when you talk about impact it's certainly when I look at these charts and, and you're talking about this kind of uncharted territory, when you see this, for instance, the unemployment rate, which is kind of where we start when we're trying to predict what's going to happen with foreclosures, this unprecedented spike, uh, you know, in, in a month's time in unemployment rate to definitely above last recession levels and getting close to depression era levels. When I look at that and some of the other charts, it's hard to imagine that that is not going to have some impact on foreclosures because there is a tight correlation between unemployment rate and foreclosures historically. There are, of course, a lot of differences this time around uh, in the nature of how that unemployment came about, but it's hard to imagine no impact. So we're, you know, one of the things I'm working on is a, a long range forecast of what we think is going to, to happen. And of course, nobody knows for sure. But we do see, you know, I don't know what the word for it is, but we see an increase uh, in volume of foreclosures for sure. It's going to be a delay because of all the efforts made to prevent foreclosures. But that is, uh, we do see that coming. It might be the end of 2021 into 2022 even before we see that, but we do see that coming. Okay. Now you've put it out there quite a ways. Now there's some states that actually have a very lengthy foreclosure process, but I think what you're saying is there's going to be a big attempt and very little appetite to foreclose immediately on somebody that's not making their payment due to the ramifications of the coronavirus. So, which is a pretty sensible policy, I think. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we, we would generally agree with this approach to the forbearance approach that's being taken to give, uh, just because of the unprecedented nature of, of all of this, um, to give people who are impacted by the coronavirus time to recover uh, and not just making a need, you know, not just immediately going into, into foreclosure. And I think that's, that is certainly something we see as a lesson learned from the last crisis. As you know, we, one of the charts you looked at, I know, is the trustee sales and the notices of default. And that was a leading indicator last time around that we were getting into trouble somehow. And 
we're certainly not seeing that. We're seeing delinquency rates spike, but that's not translating into notice of defaults and notices of trustee sale because of this forbearance along with the foreclosure moratorium. Combined with the fact that this is a, a, an election year, that's going to continue that effort to prevent unnecessary foreclosures. And we think that's a good thing. Otherwise, you could see ripple effects that <laughs> that are that nobody wants to see um, if you just let those properties go to foreclosure. Right. But the couple points I would make out make it make, and then I would love to hear what you think about this too, because <laughs> you have been looking looking at this for longer than I have. But the couple reasons that we still see eventually there's going to be an increase and a wave of foreclosures is first of all, you know, you said at the at the end of 2019 you could count the number of foreclosures on your on your hands or whatever, but there was a very low, low level of foreclosures happening, but our business was actually growing because we were gaining market share. And it was actually a pretty good volume of foreclosures. We were doing, bringing about, just looking at the numbers, make sure I get this right here, but 1,500 properties to auction a week just through our platform. And we're nationwide. So there is volume there. and But that's virtually been cut off. On our platform, it went from that 1,500 a week to literally single digits a week. I mean, which is crazy. Right. And so the point I would make there is there's this kind of, you know, and I don't want to sound callous when I say it, but there's this kind of business as usual foreclosures that was happening, um, even in a great economy. And that with these moratoriums, those have largely been cut off. And those are foreclosures that are probably going to happen. Correct. Um, But they're just, being kicked down the road. And so that alone is going to cause some kind of increase in, in foreclosures. But then on top of that, you do have, there's a percentage of people impacted by this coronavirus who it is going to have a long-term impact on them. If you look at some of the unemployment numbers, certainly the temporary layoffs are the biggest percentage of that. But the, and those are the ones that have come down recently. But the, there's different ways of looking at it, but the, the permanent job loss numbers are continuing to climb. And those are the people eventually who would be at most at risk for uh, foreclosure down the road. But yeah, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on, on, um, on how you see that playing out. There's some mitigating factors in place that create safety. Once the equity position that's in place, probably never been bigger and I think the interest rates being so low, you know, you'll have a chance maybe to refi. It looks to me like there's going to be a lot of patience about chasing the asset that's not getting been not getting paid for, you know, on a monthly basis. And that could include, you know, state policies and moratoriums and you know, who knows what. So, here's a good question for you. Mm-hmm. Do you do you think you can you can have price declines without a great increase in foreclosures? Cuz I I haven't ever seen that. Certainly with our model that when we're looking, forecasting out, unemployment is a big input. And then the other big input is equity, home equity, as you mentioned. It's a cushioning factor um, that will, when you look at the model, it <laughs> it pulls back what foreclosures would have otherwise been in, in a less equity rich environment. And I think when we've seen home prices, all the charts I I remember looking at when you do see that home price decline. Um, you see a, a rise in foreclosures come with that. And certainly that when we put into our model a price decline, along with the unemployment situation, the numbers are higher, <laughs> not surprisingly, that we, w- that we spit out than, um, than when you don't have that price decline paired with the unemployment numbers. The, the only example that I lived through that I could relate to this was in Grand Junction, Colorado, when the oil shale companies left uh, suddenly. This was probably in 83 or 84, and a booming area literally had 50% vacancy rate inside of six months, and prices declined. The inventory that I bought, uh, I bought at 20 cents on former value. So that was an isolated incident that got created by unemployment. Basically, that's what drove that and every other chart, you know, cascaded down. So that's the one thing, you know, I was, I'm still surprised at the the number that they're giving us for unemployed, the percentage of unemployed. And when I do the math, I'm just looking at going, 
I just don't know if I buy that. To me, it looks like it's in the high teens or something, but I, you know, just looking at how many claims of unemployment are still coming out. And then you have the end of the PPP mm -hmm. program where, and now round number two of the coronavirus, where you're, you just closed in California restaurants and barbers and all that again, you're going to be, there's going to be a fair amount of those people that just say, well, that's it. That's it, man. So that's it. Meaning they're, going to, uh, they're not going to go back into business. Right. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so there's just going to be all the, yeah, sudden, and I think, I mean, the, the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics has acknowledged that there's a, you know, kind of an error in their miscalculation. I think they call it a misclassification in their numbers that would make the unemployment rate much higher, um, closer to those high teens that you're talking about, because they didn't, you know, they're in uncharted territory as well, right? And they, they were misclassifying some folks who were away from work. They usually assume that was on vacation or just for a maternity leave or something like that. But it's actually those, those people they're saying probably many of them should be included as, as unemployed as well. And they weren't. So that's kind of why I asked you about, do you think we could have a price decline without a big rise in foreclosures? And I think what this is my take of, uh, and I don't know how go, long it can go on, but it seems like there's really going to be an effort to say, okay, we're not going to foreclose on people that can't make their payment. So I don't know what you have in place. Let's say they, they take this forbearance and bring it out to however long it's necessary. You know, what if it's necessary for 18 months? Well, at a mortgage rate of under 3%, you know, you can stack that at the back end. They got pretty good at loan modifications, but if you don't have massive foreclosures, it's hard to imagine uh, having a big decline in price, which would be really helpful. So that's, I, I wonder if that's where the policies are going to leave. If in fact, we really have coronavirus number two and uh, unemployment is really closer to, you know, great depression levels than a recovering recession. Yeah, I think certainly we see a lot of, you know, the political bias right now is toward uh, giving people as much time as necessary. And certainly with the election, that could swing more, even more in that direction. Yeah, I mean, you could foresee that, uh, you know, I don't know, but what's the end, end goal of that? The most extreme example, which is hard to imagine happening, but I suppose it could, is that, okay, let's just uh, kind of like universal unemployment, universal mortgage <laughs> payment, but we'll pay for everybody's mortgage and uh, you're off the hook type of thing, I guess, would be the maybe ultimate manifestation of that and i'm sure there would be some there's got to be some ripple and effects and unintended consequences of that i'm not sure what all of those would be at this point yeah and but I, certainly I, on the lending industry and i'm um, I'm, I'm kind of talking worst yeah. case scenario i'm sure i sure hope it, it doesn't get there do you see states that will be big losers as far as migration and who are the big gainers that's uh good that you asked that i was just looking at the migration data from the census that uh, was actually put out a couple months ago, but and then looking overlaying some of the census designations on our own data and public record data, sales data, mm -hmm. and you're already seeing in 2019, which is the census data, it's from 2019, so it's pre-pandemic for sure. New York was the biggest loser in terms of net migration, um, with many of the counties in New York City at the top of that list, and then also California was the second biggest loser, followed by Illinois and and many of the especially coastal counties in California, losing population to, to net migration. And I, when I look at the, the sales rate, which is an indication of what real estate investors are doing or where they're interested in properties um, on our platform, uh, you, we see that it's actually a reversal. Last year, the sales rate, which the sales rate is just the percentage of properties that are available at auction than actually sell. That percentage uh, was highest a year ago in zip codes that had that were designated by the census as, um, as being in cities. But that's uh, the city sales rate has actually declined, especially for the online uh, auctions that we do. Mm -hmm. And now we see this, the suburban sales rate has seen the biggest increase in the sales rate. So that tells me investors are most interested in now in properties in the suburbs 
versus the city and and that actually kind of piles on the the trend that was already happening because of taxes and weather and all the other things that were driving people out of California and out of uh, New York and, and Illinois um, and two places like the biggest gainers and are no surprise I'm sure to your, you and your audience but um, you know Texas and Florida and California or excuse me Texas and Florida and Arizona and North Carolina the to me the pandemic is going to accelerate those trends for different reasons in a sense because of the some of the health issues uh, associated with higher density housing and um, and of course then the remote work capability that is much more widespread now. You know, one of the things that dawns on me once in a while, and now that we're Riverside County and well, California in general is just kind of re-locked down industries, is that when you have a when you have a weekend and your mind forgets for a moment that things aren't normal, you kind of go, okay, well, what do you want to do this weekend? And you go down a list of stuff. You can't go out to eat. Can't go to the movie. Let's turn on a ball. No, can't. That's they're not playing yet. And <laughs> in the back of your mind, you just go, you know, round one. You maybe it was in more acceptable because it was like a there's there it is. It's a two month window or a six week window. We'll be good. Round two, I think, is going to have more of a psychological impact than round one, where people are going, wow, is this the new normal, you know? And even families in schools, like Joey just mentioned, and he just, you know, you think, okay, well, well, at least the kids are going to go to school. Oh, well, no, they're not. And you're going, some of this stuff, you just go, and I guess here's why I'm, at, I'm bringing that up. When you start to feel like you don't know the rules of engagement, you you stop participating or you go to a safe zone. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, actually I, I can definitely identify that with that. My wife and I were just talking about that last night. It's, okay. You know, we're kind of at this point where it seemed like I, I you know, I thought, okay, surely this is going to be over by the summer, at least by the end of the summer. And then the kids will be back in school and things will be back to normal. Right. doesn't look like the path that we're on right now. And, and so, yeah, that then all of a sudden you're like, well, if things aren't going to go back to normal, then I maybe could rethink everything. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. yeah, I think that's, that's true. And we certainly in our circle of folks and we're in California, we were already seeing a lot of our friends leave just anecdotally, but it feels like that is even accelerated. And these are people, it's, it's kind of weird because they're people we haven't seen in person since the pandemic started, but we hear, Oh, there, or we hear, see on Facebook or wherever that they're moving to Idaho or they're moving to Texas. And it feels like that has, that's increased and it's only increased since the pandemic. So I think, um, yeah, people are open to when your world gets so disrupted, you're open to a lot more, uh, different options. And, yeah, to your point, I think, you know, just in terms of economic implications, how you interact with the typical goods and services that you're, that you're, uh, that you typically buy could, could change as well. I think the way the states have, you know, have handled the pandemic too is it sort of go, you kind of go, wow, I didn't know they could, I didn't know they could mandate that. I didn't know they could make that decision without some type of vote or participation of the public. It's just sort of like proclamation. And I, that's another thing when you just go, okay, wow, I, I didn't know they could do that. I literally listed my residence for sale two days ago. And I've already, wow. I've already bought a home in Florida that we're going to move to. Now I've been gradually moving assets to Florida. Um, I'm a big believer in Florida's future because of the migration that they get and the way their population grows. So as a, as somebody that follows the statistics, I have looked at these charts for 30 years and every, every once in a while you have an aha moment that you just go, I am so excited that I, that I saw that. So a hundred percent of California's population gain. So set aside migration for a moment, a hundred percent of the net population gain for California is births over deaths, a natural increase. 95% of Florida's 
population gain is net migration and net immigration. It's an adult ready to buy or rent something. In California, they're one day old. That's a very difference in future. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I love that. I, and I, that, I, um, I had never yeah. seen that before. I'd concentrated on immigration and, and migration and, and all of that. But when you actually look at the population gain, you go, wow, that's not an adult ready to participate for a long time. Right. So, so when you, the other thing is California has got some, obviously it's got some budget issues for future promises and stuff, but a very large percentage of taxes are paid by a very small percentage of occupants. And that's going to be one of the things that tilt policies. You know, when you start having people leave that are paying a lot of the bill, I mean, there's still the bill to be paid and the promises. So they're either going to have to raise taxes or they're going to have to break promises. I mean, honestly, that's, that's kind of why I'm looking at it going, I think maybe now is a good time. Yeah. Maybe I, I need to, to do follow you, Bruce, but a friend of mine, I, I literally had li- listed the house. I would say less than an hour a good friend of mine in the industry is you're freaking people out. They've noticed your house is for sale. <laughs> I'm going, are you kidding me? <laughs> we just put it up for sale. Oh my God. So, yeah. I, and I've, I've obviously loved living in California and uh, California is a survivor and they, you know, but I think you're going to go, I think we're going to go through a rough patch. And I think, you know, this is the other thing when you start thinking about what's likely I'm going to sell a house in Riverside that's gone up a half a million dollars. And when I sell it, I don't have a tax bill. That to me is astonishing. And I also think it's going to be short lived. That's, that's an, that's a crazy thing to have in place. And when you're searching for money, if you're the U S government or the California government, I think that's one of the things that's going to go. And I thought, eh, I don't want that to go <laughs> for me anyway. <laughs> I want to take advantage of that. That's right. Yeah. That, that is a crazy thing, and um, I think a lot. But what's also crazy is how, how hot the California market uh, seems to be. And I would suspect that your house, if it follows a pattern of, of what, what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing, is, is going to sell very quickly. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's not an inexpensive house, but it was listed for a day, and we had a showing last night. In Florida, I can tell you we can't, we can't keep anything. So we're building homes in Florida and it's very common for them to go pending in a day. And then we have 10 buyers that wanted it and they ask, okay, well, where's your next one? So, I mean, literally they're driving to something that's a shell going, you know, when that's, you know, when that's further along, we want to put it pending. So now part of that is that you had a, you, you kind of had a hole where people weren't participating. So sales volume went down to, well, you know, probably, I don't know the exact number, 30% of normal. And now you, you're kind of playing catch up, but you also had an extraordinary amount of people pull their listings, right? And just go to the Mm -hmm. sidelines. So it's an interesting combination that we we probably in California will play catch up for the rest of the year. And I don't know that there'll be big price impacts on California because of that. Yeah, you have, you have this period. And I I do think that in some ways, uh, a little bit of a calm before the storm, and it might take this, the storm a while to arrive, but we're in this period where things, you look at a lot of housing market metrics and they look very good. In fact, better than, than ever in some cases. And, um, but yeah, I think there is this, this catch up happening with the imbalance, the, the supply and demand imbalance coming, rewriting itself. And then, yeah, the whole foreclosure issue that we talked about, that is going to have some of those are going to have to hit eventually. I mean, maybe not as big of a wave. Many of the people who are uh, are in forbearance will never go into foreclosure, and, and we're suspecting that. But um, that is that is going to hit, and so we're in a little little bit of a Pollyanna uh, moment right now. I think before things uh, on the housing market side start to to look a little worse. Yeah, two long term trends. I'm curious on your opinion of this. Mortgage rates start with a two. That's uh, slightly unusual, as in <laughs> may, maybe never. So do you think that will cause people to stay in place for a much longer time? So I've refied my house at two and a half. I am going nowhere. Yeah, I think, you know, we were already seeing that trend in homeownership tenures 
being longer uh, yeah. and, and continuing to lengthen. I think that would, I would suspect that would push that further. Yeah, you know, why should I move now? I swear, yeah, I, if I could refi now, it could it could motivate. I think some people t- to move up or, or change uh, residences in order to uh, to take advantage of those low interest rates on a purchase. But yeah, generally speaking, I think that's the the primary motivation there is to to stay put if you can get that. The other thing is okay. So you're let's say you're a lender. It's kind of funny. I, I probably spoke in front of a lending group and I, I told them you're going to end up with a 2% mortgage rate. And uh, well, Kerry Pierce is a guy that I've, I've used for, for years whenever I do any of that stuff. The lender, he actually had to switch jobs because the lender that he worked for for years just left the market because they thought the refi business was dead because it represented over 50% of their business. So they literally closed their doors. So what's going to be really interesting at some point, you're going to have, uh, the refi business literally do a decade worth of business and be done this year. And that'll be interesting in the ramifications of employment that's necessary in the, in that industry. So you're saying, I mean, there's, there's a certain point where it can't go any lower. And so once we've hit that and everybody's, most people have refied, then the business is going to, to dry up very quickly. Yeah. I mean, think about, you know, when I first I, I had almost a free and clear house that I refied to become a real estate investor in 1981. So not good timing. I refied at 17 and a half. So <laughs> ever since then, there's been an ability to refi. If you pick and choose your spots at a lesser and lesser rate, I refied once at 12. I thought that was so exciting from 17 and a half. That was great. And then, you know, gradually you pay under 10 and people who thought they would never go under 10 um, were shocked and now it's under three. So yeah, at some point you would think in the future we'll have interest rates that are more normalized. And I, it'll be interesting to see the industry cope with that because it literally will mean half of your business isn't coming back. You'll use it up in advance, sort of like builders in 2004 and five were building crazy amounts of homes because they were being bought by people that typically wouldn't qualify or investors. And then there was a big hole. It's like, oh my gosh, we pre-built all these homes, well, we'll have refied a decade's worth of refis in a, in a year. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting way to think of it. And it's crazy that I think I, I was at one of your, I did hear you predict the 2% mortgage rates. I was probably over, over a year ago um, when I was seeing you speak. So yeah, you saw that coming. Yeah. We and, said, we said it about three years ago and every, I trust me, I've been uh, in 2017, Joey just put up and I, so yeah, I've, I've gotten a few calls. Where's that, where's that 2% mortgage rate? So I'm a real happy guy. It showed up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I just got it on, on my house. So I'm happy about that too. Yeah. That's amazing. Darren, we have run out of time. I wish you the best and auction.com will land in the right square. They're very famous for picking what's next. Yeah. We're excited about that. We're looking, uh, we're looking for that as well. So thank you for those words and thank you for um, inviting me to be on. It's great to be here. My pleasure, Darren. Let's keep in touch. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911. Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.